You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. Hi, and welcome to The Blackest Questions. I'm your host, Dr. Christina Greer, politics editor for The Grio and associate professor of political science at Fordham University. In this podcast, we ask our guests five of the blackest questions so we can learn a little bit more about them and have fun while we're doing it. We're also going to learn a lot about black history, past and present. So, the way this works, we have five rounds of questions about us, black history, the whole diaspora, current events, everything. With each round, the questions will get a little tougher, and the guest has 10 seconds to get it right. If they answer the question correctly, they'll receive a symbolic black fist and hear this. If they get it wrong, they'll hear this. But we'll still love them anyway. After the five questions, there'll be a black bonus round at the end just for fun. Our guest this episode is Justin Tinsley. He's an accomplished writer hailing from Virginia and a proud alum, in his words, of the real HU, Hampton University. He's currently a senior culture writer for Anscape, formerly The Undefeated, and even makes appearances on ESPN's Around the Horn. His new book, which I love, It Was All a Dream, Biggie and the World That Made Him, is out now. Hi, Justin. Thank you so much for joining The Blackest Questions. Yo, first and foremost, thank you for having me on. Secondly, I am nervous as hell because, like, I've been telling myself, it's like, all right, it's five questions. You got to at least get two right. You know, you got to at least get yeah. two right. You got to you gotta bat 40%, 400 or something like that. So, and that's great. Oh, I am, I am nervous. But here's the thing, Mr. Tinsley. Mm-hmm. This show is for us to celebrate black people. And I think there's so many people in this country who yeah. don't know black history, which means they don't know American sure. history. So, absolutely. as a professor, I want to educate not just myself, but also my guests and my listeners. So, there is no expectation that you'll get five for five. If you do, that'll be fantastic. But I just want to hey, have a conversation with you and go on a little intellectual journey. How about that? Let's do it. I, 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 love, I love games like this. I'm also very nervous, but right. let's do no it. No need to be let's nervous. Let's do it. You with me. Yeah. You with me. Yeah. Look, I look. I know You're I'm a good fan. people. Look, I know I'm a good people, but I don't like like you said. You said on camera that you won't be embarrassed if I if I royally screw this up. But I know you as a friend and as somebody who has helped me so much within my journey. Like I can't disappoint Doctor no. Greer off camera. <laughs> Absolutely not. We don't revoke black cards on this show. <laughs> it's all love. It's all celebration. For sure. I think you're ready. I, I, look, let's you do ready? it. Let's do it. Okay. First question. On April 16th, 2018, he became the first rapper to be awarded the Pulitzer Prize. Who was it and for what album? I do know this one. Kendrick Lamar, damn. Right. See? You're killing it already. I got one. I got one. That's right. <laughs> so, Kendrick Lamar, it was the first time the award had gone to a musical work outside of the genres of classical music and jazz music. Mm-hmm. Kendrick was born and raised in Compton, California, as many of you may know, and he was discovered by Dr. Dre and signed to Top Dog Entertainment. And the Pulitzer Committee called Damn, quote, virtuosic unified by its vernacular authenticity and rhythmic dynamism that offers affecting vignettes capturing the complexity of modern African-American life, end quote. That's a mouthful to say. The album's (laughs) brilliant, and he talks about a lot of societal issues that affect black people and society at large, right? Exactly. (laughs) Having written this amazing book, and I'm going to keep talking about it, it was all a dream, Biggie and the World That Made Him, How, how big is this for rap? for Kendrick Lamar to have a Pulitzer Prize because you did some extensive research on Biggie and like just also the origins of hip hop in Brooklyn and some regional conversations that are important to have. To have a Pulitzer, which as also a writer, you know, yeah. is the creme de la creme. What does that mean for this this confluence of rap and writers and journalism and this award in the Pulitzer? It's wild because, you know, he won a, he won a Pulitzer for this but he didn't get like album of the year at the Grammy. Mm. Like he's been he's been robbed of that award so many times. So I I, I think when Kendrick was awarded this, it, it it was it was proof that hip hop, not just Kendrick, but hip hop as a whole in its best in in its most optimal form, is arguably the most honest form of like societal critique that we have. And what Kendrick was talking about in that album, he obviously he was doing that in previous albums with To Pimp a Butterfly, which a lot of people feel is his best project. My me personally That's my favorite. Okay, and completely under like that that's one of those albums that I have to like really you know how like when you would like go to church with like uh-huh. your grandparents 
like when you were younger and they would bring they, they would read the lyrics to the songs that the choir was actually singing yes that's what I have to do with To Pimp a Butterfly. Like, I have to actually read the lyrics while he's rapping them to me. Right. Because, I, so. He makes you earn it. He makes you he earn make, the it, appreciation. That is a perfect way to describe it. Just like, it. He I makes feel like Outkast does that. You can't yep. just, like, turn on an Outkast album. Like, I love it. It's like, you have to listen to no, it and, you and try and, to, like, decode it. Decode is a great word. So, when Kendrick was awarded this this Pulitzer for, for Damn, it was really like he could have got it for To Pimp a Butterfly. He could have he could have got it for which is my personal favorite Kendrick album, Good Kid, Mad City. It was more of a a career award than it was just actually with this album, which is a phenomenal album for the record. I look back on moments like that, and then I think about like what people were saying about hip hop, especially in its early stages, that this was a musical genre that eventually was going to fade away like mm. disco. It was a trend; mm. it wouldn't last. And now we see hip hop winning. Pulitzer Prizes. We see hip hop as a, when, when you look at Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, all these music streaming platforms right now, hip hop is the most streamed art form, not just in America, but in the world. They, they account for almost 32% of all music streams. Where does Kendrick rank in your pantheon of hip hop artists? Ooh. Like, is he top five, top 10, top 15? At the very, very least, top five. Because when people say he's the greatest rapper of this this generation, how, how long do you consider mm. a generation? Because Kendrick Kendrick has been relevant on the hip hop scene, whether it's underground or whether it's mainstream, since at least 2008, 2009. Overly dedicated was 2010. So if you take from 2010 to the present day, which is right now, that's 12 years. So if he's been the best rapper of the last 12 years, and hip hop as a whole right, that's uh, is only 50 years old. Right. You know, he's on Mount Rushmore in some way. For, for me, for uh -huh. me, he is. And I think his body of work justifies that. So I would I honestly would put him on that Mount Rushmore for me. OK. All right. Well, listen, you're killing it. You ready for number two? Uh, No, let's stop the game right now, because I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm let's leave on top, Greer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But let's go. Number two. OK, let's go. This school was founded on February 25th, 1837. And to this day, they're the oldest HBCU still in operation. What school is it? Okay. Uh, what you said, February 1837? Uh-huh. All right. Oh, I got 10 seconds. Uh, you know what? I'm going to say Wilberforce University. Ooh, that is close. And that's a solid, solid guess. It's actually Cheney University ah, of Pennsylvania. You're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. First known as the African Institute, it was renamed the Institute for Colored Youth. It provided training in trades and agriculture. And then in 1902, the school relocated to George Cheney's 275-acre property, 25 miles west of Philadelphia, which is my city. Uh, the name Cheney became associated with it since 1913 and had several name changes. But in 1983, Cheney State College became Cheney State University of Pennsylvania. Some notable alums are Ed Bradley, longtime 60 Minutes journalist, Jim Vance, longtime DC TV anchor, and Andre Waters, a 12-year NFL veteran. As an HBCU alum, I know that you are a proud Hampton University alum. How do you go about supporting other HBCUs? I try to support HBCUs in every walk that I can. Obviously, you know, I went to Hampton University and I love my school. And uh, But I'm not one of those Hampton grads that will fight to the death about Hampton Howard. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not, it, to me, it's not that deep. Like, I, I got mad love for Howard. I have a lot of friends who went to Howard. But I grew up in a household that, that cherished HBCUs for, from as long as I can remember. My mother is a third generation uh, alum, alumna of South Carolina State University down in Orangeburg, uh, South Carolina. And my grandfather, he, uh, my grandfather and my grandmother both went mm -hmm. to HBCUs. Uh, and my grandfather, he was inducted into the CIAA Hall of Fame posthumously in 2009. So, and I grew up down the street from Virginia State University. So all I knew in terms of the college experience when I was growing up was the HBCU lifestyle. And I saw the, the camaraderie. I saw the sense of community. I saw the sense of family just going to these type of campuses and, and football games or basketball games or whatever the case may be. That's what I wanted. So I try to I try to represent for HBCUs when, whenever I can. I know in recent years, HBCUs have been given more of a, 
a light and more more coverage, which I think is incredible. But I think there's still a long way to go. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you know, whenever I think about HBCs, my grandparents and great grandparents went to Tennessee State and Fan. Yeah. And I got, you know, then we got the Atlanta crowd with my cousins sure. with Morehouse and Spelman, and my mom went to Florida Memorial actually. Oh, really? Southern okay. Florida. So, you know, we're deep on the HBCs, even though I went to an HWCU. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, I think it's really important for us to remember that so many of these HBCUs don't have the same resources because of the wealth gap of black people in this country because of white supremacy and anti-black racism. So even when you have successful HBCU grads that go into a society where they don't make as much. Black women making 60 some odd cents on the dollar, black men making 80 some odd cents on the dollar. So even to to give that money back to an institution, it's not the same as uh, white alums from HWCUs. So both of us share a, a mad love for HBCUs and we both come from a long legacy of HBCUs. For All sure. Right. So you ready for the third question? You're killing the game out here. All right, all right. I'm on a one question wrong streak, so let me try to get back on the the proper footing. Let's let's do it. Question three. The NBA has been around for 75 years, but in 1950, three men helped break the color barrier and are considered the league's first African-American pioneers. Do you know who they are and what their contributions were? Oh, you would, oh, like this is gonna make me look bad. Uh, I definitely know who the three men are, but for whatever reason, I cannot call their names. I mean, listen, yeah. this is why we have the show, because all of us, it's probably yeah. on the tip of the tongue of so many listeners. Yep. So Chuck Cooper was the first African-American to be yep. drafted by an NBA team. Nathaniel Sweetwater, yep. Sweetwater Clifton was the first to sign mm-hmm. an NBA contract. And Earl Lloyd was the first to play in an NBA game. And their debuts were just days apart from one another. And so Chuck Cooper was drafted by the Boston Celtics. Nathaniel Clifton was a Harlem Globetrotter and played for the New York Knicks. And on October 31st, 1950, Earl Lloyd made his debut for the Washington Capitals, scoring six points. And in 1955, he helped the Syracuse Nationals win an NBA title. It's wild because Earl Earl Lloyd's name, that was the one I knew, but I couldn't remember the other two. And as soon as you said it, I was like, of course, that's, that's what of it course. is. And you know what's wild? Uh, Chuck. Chuck Cooper. You said he was drafted by the the Boston Celtics, which is wild because there's this juxtaposition with obviously we know the history of the city of Boston, and I know a lot of black people from the city of Boston. I spent time there. My dad went to college there. Half of his frat brothers still live there. See, and and when you talk to people who spend a lot of time in Boston or either who are from Boston, like black folks in particular, they'll give you a different side or they'll give you a different, you know, experience of what we know about Boston from a racial standpoint. The Boston Celtics were in the NBA finals this year. And we know about the history of the city of Boston, but this current Boston Celtics team is pretty black. Like, when you think of Boston, yeah, exactly. you don't really think about these tattoo wearing brothers no, who are representing the Celtics don't. in twenty twenty two. Like the whole the whole right. starting five is all all black. That's the the, the coach uh-huh. is black. It, 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 this was his first year. Looking at the Boston Celtics as a team in comparison to what we know about Boston and its history with uh, race relations is is one of the more fascinating things I think I've ever researched it, 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 just in my time as a journalist who covers sports quite often. I'm also just fascinated by how certain leagues just are and feel more black, yeah. right? I mean, we we know that the Major League Baseball teams have gone more to like the Caribbean and like the Dominican Republic and Cuba. I've got a question. Yeah. Who was your favorite player growing up and who's your favorite player playing right now? Ooh. That, that's a loaded question because that can get very hard. When I was younger, I told myself I wanted to be 6'6", like Michael Jordan. I wanted to go to the University of North Carolina. I tried to give myself a bald head when I was younger. Uh, my mom told me I look nothing like Michael Jordan. She said I look more like a light bulb than Michael Jordan, as you can tell. Uh, <laughs> Michael Jordan and I are two completely different like skin complexions, but I, I worship the ground Michael Jordan walked on. So, of course, him. I hold a deep, deep love and a deep, deep passion in my heart for Allen Iverson. And it goes far beyond just us being Virginia natives. My favorite player currently, and it's been like this for for quite a while, uh, would be LeBron. He's had a career and he's had time in the, the public spotlight and he's handled it better than I believe Who anybody. Could, he's 
he's now been in the league longer than he was out of the league. Yeah, he's yeah. He's literally raised in the league. Yeah. I mean, you give an 18-year-old a few hundred million dollars, and this is what he's been able to do with it as far as uplifting his community, yeah. uplifting Akron, uplifting his boys. I mean, it's pretty it's pretty impressive. I would put him as my favorite modern-day player, but Dominique Wilkins Ooh, growing up, that was... The human I had him like reel. his trading card. Oh, the human <laughs> highlight. I love Dominique. Dominique has one of the coldest Dominique throwback Wilkins. jerseys. I still don't have it. I'm still trying to get it in my collection. Dominique Wilkins, I got a lot of love in my heart for, for the human highlight reel. Such an incredible player. You ready for number four? <sighs> yes, I am. So from 1973 to 1980, this person served as Bat Boy and later vice president for what team? And while on the job, he later got a stage name from what athlete? Wow, you stumped me again. Stanley Burrell was Bat Boy for the Oakland A's, and while he was Bat Boy, people called him Hammer because of how much he resembled Hammer and Hank Aaron. He later became known as MC Hammer. Yo, I never knew that. Are you serious? So, H.C. Hammer was discovered by the A's owner, Charlie Finley, doing James Brown splits in the Oakland Coliseum parking lot. Hammer was a Bat Boy, then later jokingly given the title of Executive VP, he sat in the owner's box and earned $7.50 a game. And while the owner was away, he would relay game action to the owner over the phone. And then Hank Aaron went on to become the first ballot Major League Baseball Hall of Famer in 1982, hitting for a 305 batting average, 755 home runs with 3,771 hits. And he passed away on January 22nd, 2021. So that is the link between MC Hammer and Hank Yo, Aaron. Yo, that is, not, I never knew where Hank, like, I could have probably easily Googled this. This is why you come wow. on the show, Justin, to learn things. MC Hammer was named after Hank now, see, Aaron? And... Wow. Right. But I think, you know, this is what's so important between, for what I see from your work, not just your book about Biggie, but the work that you do on ESPN, because there is this intersection of sports and rap that you, you I think, balance so beautifully. There's so many hip-hop artists that really, truly, and yeah. deeply love sports. I mean, I'm thinking about J. Cole, where it's like, he's playing yeah, yeah, for sure. basketball like, to his own music. Wow. <laughs> like, I never... I, yeah, I that that is... Wow, I might have to actually write on that. That's phenomenal. I, I never knew MC Hammer got his name from Hank Aaron. When we think about Oakland and, like, the role it plays in sort of Ooh, the West Coast sure. collective blackness, we can't forget about MC Hammer. But then when we think about hip hop going mainstream, you know, so that Kendrick Lamar mm -hmm. can get a, a Pulitzer, we got to think about all that MC Hammer did. He had a cartoon, he had cereal. I mean, he was uh, one of, I would say, one of the biggest crossover rap stars ever. Oh, uh, he was he was a bona fide superstar. Like my my mother will tell you, like the first rap song that I ever rem remembered memorizing was "Can't Touch This." Fresh new kicks and bands, you got it like that. Now you know you wanna dance. So move out of your seat. Like she would have to play it over. You know how kids these days like like to listen to Baby Shark. Yes. You know whatever it is. My Baby Shark was "Can't Touch This" by MC Hammer, and my mom would tell you it was that song. And uh, looking for a new love by Jody Watley. Like oh. I would want to hear those two songs back to back to to the point where my mom probably can't listen to those songs to this day because she was like, "No, you've li we listened to it enough when you were in the backseat of the car when I was taking you to school." As you said, you can't really talk about the black experience in this country without talking about Oakland, California, on so mm -hmm. many levels, from, from one hip hop to uh, the Black Panthers, of course, and three like. Oakland is where, if you do your research on Richard Pryor, Richard Pryor spent a lot of time in Oakland. He spent a lot of time with people like Huey Newton and Bobby Seale and, and people like that and Angela Davis. And uh, so when you listen to Richard Pryor's work in the 70s and it takes on like this political type tone, he got a lot of that from his time in Oakland and speaking oh. to people like that. So Oakland is is vital, is vital and critical to the history of this country and critical to black history, which, as you said early on, is American history, so. Right, okay, it's the last one. I think we can make it. All right, I gotta go out on a good note here. I gotta go out on a good note. Who was the first black person ever elected governor, and from what state did they preside over? Ooh, uh. And here's a hint, or Commonwealth. Oh yeah, no, look, see, I was gonna, obviously my answer is L. Douglas Wilder in Virginia. You are correct. So Lawrence Douglas Wilder, we just know him as 
Doug Wilder yep. of Virginia. He was elected in 1990 and held office until 1994 because, as a political scientist, some people don't know this, in Virginia, you're only elected for one term. That's it. He received his undergrad degree from Virginia Union. He received his law degree mm-hmm. from Howard. And he started his political career in the 70s and went on to become a senator, a lieutenant governor, and most recently, mayor of Richmond. Uh, from 2005 to 2009. He's also a published author. Um, so growing up sort of in and around Virginia, do you have any memories of Governor Wilder? So you're familiar with the Jack and Jill program, right? Oh, I was in Jack and Jill. Okay, good. And mind you now, I was also kicked out of Jack and Jill, the Philadelphia chapter. <laughs> that's for that's for a different podcast. That is that is for a different <laughs> podcast, for sure. I was, I was a little rapscallion, if we should say. The, this guy who, he lived in my neighborhood, and you know, uh, rest in peace to Mr. Bell, um, he lived on the other side of the block in my neighborhood and he came over to my mom and grandma's house one day and he was like, I think Justin should be part of like Project Manhood. It's like young black men and, you know, trying to like, you know, influence them to make positive decisions. Yeah. And I was like, man, this sounds corny. I don't want to do it. But I ended up doing it and they took us to like a lot of different events and I ended up, you know, gaining like a, a big appreciation for it. And one of the events we went to was like this formal dinner where, uh, you know, Governor Wilder was there. And with like, so myself and like a couple of my homeboys, we got a chance to take a picture with, the, you know, the Governor Wilder. And we, we couldn't have been any more than like 12 or 13 at the time. And it was cool. But you still remember it. Yeah, right? I still I mean, remember it. Like I meeting see, an elected official is huge. I see the picture on Facebook like at least once a year when uh, my boy, who's actually in the Navy now, he's over in Germany. He reposted every year. I'm like, man, I remember that. A fun fact about L. Douglas Wilder is, uh, you know, I mentioned that Allen Iverson is one of my favorite basketball players of all time. You can't talk about Allen Iverson and his impact right. without talking about L. Douglas Wilder. Have you ever written about that? I would yeah, love for yeah, you to write yeah. about that. You know, I'm I'm hoping I would love to write a book. I would love to do Allen Iverson's autobiography one day. You know, that that's a hey, goal. Let's of mine. name it and claim it, brother. Yeah, put it let's in the name universe. it and claim it. Put it in the Ask, universe. Ask believe receive. What I love about your book, It Was All a Dream, Biggie and the World That Made Him. What I love about it is that you do weave in a political narrative. Yeah. And a, a narrative that is so much larger than Christopher Wallace. For sure. And so to think about Allen Iverson, to think about how he was essentially targeted as a targeted as a young black man to think about how he was looking down the barrel of incarceration yep. for many many years um how you know his prospects just disappeared how he was a two sport athlete the stories we've heard about Iverson and the reputation he got that was so ill deserved i mean you know it was just so many things taken out of context and being misunderstood. I think there's a very, very powerful story to be told about Alan Iverson weaving in these contexts. And I think it's a very powerful story to be told by him, which is why I think an autobiography of Alan Iverson would be phenomenal. And of course, you know, when when I do write the book, because like you said, we got to speak it into That's the universe. Right. You know, I That's have no right. problem helping him if he needs it, of course connecting those dots because those are, that's very true like the same bowling alley where you know that fight took place in february of 1993 was the same bowling alley i used to go to when i was a student at hampton and i i think that's important it's the same reason why i did it in the biggie book because i think for so long when we talk about biggie we talk about the music and how how great it is and how how great it always will be but i also think you know we don't talk about biggie in a political uh, type stature as well. We talk about Tupac in a political stature because you know he came from that type of family. Right. He, he was the son of a panther, which of course is going to connect him to the political discourse in this country almost seamlessly. But I think Biggie as well. He's a first generation American. His mother moved here from Jamaica, dealing with uh, the seventies and the legislation that was passed and, and that wasn't passed in the seventies, and having to deal with that, and then having to come of age in the eighties when it's just you know all hell basically broke loose in the eighties. So I, right. disinvestment in our communities that he so beautifully articulates and paints us the clearest picture ever for sure. of what disinvestment in, in young black youth. looks yeah. like. Yeah. And, and all of that is within the book. And I thought, like, obviously, you tell Biggie's story from life to death and then the legacy, of course, and, 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 and a lot of which so many of us already know because we know Biggie's story. But I think when you weave that in with the, the socioeconomic, the sociopolitical, the sociocultural elements of the world around him, hence the actual title of the book, it, it paints his light in a more prolific and profound type of light than 
uh, I would like to think that has been done previously in the past. Right. And I think the book is brilliant. It was all a dream, Biggie and the world that made him. And it's, it's really providing so much more context for who these individuals are. Okay, so listen, listeners, you all heard it here first. Justin Tinsley is going to name it and claim it. We're going to be out there with this. Alan Iverson autobiography, and you will have that yes. nice assisted by mm-hmm. <laughs> Justin Tinsley. Okay, so before I let you go, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you um, for having me. We're going to have just a few black bonus questions. Okay. You ready? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, these are just quick fire. Rapid fire. Timberland yeah. or Pharrell? Ooh, Pharrell. Ooh, I wasn't expecting that. A Different World or Martin? Ooh, Martin. I think I know the answer to this one. Michael Vick or Alan Iverson? Ah, love Vic. Gotta go AI. Okay. Cookout or Bojangles? Ooh, cookout. Kendrick's Control versus Tupac's Hit Em Up. Uh, Hit Em Up. <laughs> okay. And bias aside, who has the best homecoming? Bias aside, a and Oh, ooh, solid. Oh my goodness, Justin Tinsley, I can't thank you enough for joining us. Uh, for those who haven't done so already, please go and get his book. It was all a dream, Biggie and the world that made him. Thank you all for listening to The Blackest Questions. This show was produced by Cameron Blackwell and Richard White. If you like what you heard, please give us a five-star review and subscribe to our show wherever you listen to your podcast and share it with everyone you know. And also download The Grio Podcast link wherever you get your books. You are now listening to The Grio's Black Podcast Network. Black culture amplified. Don't forget, you can listen to the Griot's Writing Black podcast hosted by me, Maisha Kai. This isn't your typical writing podcast. We interview any and everybody that has anything to do with writing, from comics to poets to authors to journalists to politicians and more. Remember, that's Writing Black every Sunday right here on the Griot's Black Podcast Network. Download the Griot's app to listen to Writing Black wherever you are.